We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation he gives us. Thank you for our stale friends. Grant your hope and strength to all of us in these days. May our faith and commitment to you and to each other continue to rise up in us and be greater. Raise up our spirits through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Rick and um, Charlene have some ministry and music for us at this time.
reply to the question, what brings you joy? And I appreciate all of you taking your time to do that. There were n numerous responses. Now, I just thought it might be good with the COVID-19 virus and our being primarily uh, at home. It just seemed like a good thing to do to ask you, what brings you joy? And there were over probably 50 responses. And many of you expressed several things that bring you joy. So I got some of those to share with you now. But this was the first person that responded, so I kind of got that out separately a little bit here. So the first person responded with these three things. Being a child of God. Going to church. And family. Well, many people have responded with some of those same things, but family probably received the highest number of responders. There were four responses that included going to church, and then family had six, and Sunshine had three, walking along the beach, listening to the stillness, reading, finishing a book, sunrises and sunsets. There have been some beautiful ones lately, haven't there? Singing. This was uh, an unusual one. Cooking for my family. Someone responded, I enjoy cooking for my family. And traveling or seeing new places. Quiet places with just me. Completed yard work. God is in control. The power of unconditional love. Meals with family. And as I said earlier, someone sent one in just this morning. They enjoy being able to Zoom with their family. Seeing God's word in action. Listening to music. And someone said, knowing that my children's needs are met. Eight years cancer-free. Boy, that's a joy. And so is this one. Survived surgery. The doctor said it was a miracle. Bird singing. Watching nature. Gardening. Color. Knowledge of music. And growing as a musician. That might have been you, Charlene. <laughs> <laughs> Outdoors enjoying God's creation. Relationships. Seeing things grow, even people spiritually. Freedom to pray and worship God. Loving church family. Getting back to God and His Word. People praying on top of a hospital. That was a group of nurses. And people singing, God bless America. People coming to Christ. People serving God and the church. And they suggested open door, vacation, Bible school, neighborhood cafe, and Operation Christmas Child and Pierce Ministry. Being able to go to worship. And Sunday school. And this one's a little different. It was just one person that responded. People speaking in open worship here at Arsdale Friends. And this came from a gentleman. I am at a place and time when I can take care of my ailing spouse. An unusual joy, but a good joy to be able to help someone, your spouse especially. Jesus' blessing and answered prayer. Daily walks with my pet. Getting together for worship again. We all look forward to that, don't we? A baby's smile. We like to hear them laugh too, don't we? New Christians. Living and seeing the Great Commission in action. Now, maybe all of us don't do this one, but it applies to some people who like to get up early. Getting up before sunrise and spending time with God and His Word. And I didn't put that one in. That was somebody else. 
And the next part of that individual's response was my morning coffee, my pillow, fragrance of grilling food. That kind of activates my taste buds right now. Jesus' blessing and answered prayer. And someone included this scripture verse from Isaiah, the 41st chapter, the 10th verse. Fear not, for I am with you. And then our superintendent, the uh, pastoral superintendent of North Carolina, uh, Friends, Friends Church in North Carolina, they wrote this scripture verse from the 126th Psalm, verse 6. And this is from Mike Wall. Those who go out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Well, I appreciate everybody's response and you taking time again to send those in. And I hope you're finding ways to find joy and to enjoying your life during these unusual times. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the uh, New Testament from the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 12, and then also verses 22 through 25. And this is Jesus and the Last Supper. He's walking into Jerusalem. He's spending time with his disciples. And so we'll be looking at some of that during my words this morning. So this is the Last Supper. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And then going down to verse 22, And the meal had started, the disciples had gathered in the, upper, in the room there with Jesus, and verse 22 reads, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So Jesus' last meal here on earth with his disciples is titled, the Last Supper. And it's during Passover week, a very significant and important time in the days of the children of Israel. Today is Palm Sunday for us, a day that we remember our Savior riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. As people sang, Hosanna, as they laid their cloaks down before him in palm branches. The Passover was a great celebration to remember God delivering the children of Israel from the Egyptian slavery. And during this week, Jesus ate his last Passover meal with his disciples, known as the Last Supper. And on Friday, he died on the cross for our sins, for everyone's sins, for all who believe, for all who seek him. As one thinks about Jesus' march to the cross, our hearts and minds should be renewed with power and faith because Jesus knowingly went to the cross for us, for those things that we do wrong. He walked into Jerusalem knowing it would be his last supper, his last living days with the disciples, his best friends, those that he taught and been with, but he did it knowing he would face excruciating death on the cross. And so this walk should give you and I a desire to be a greater part of his work to build the kingdom. Here at our still friends, in the world where we live and where we work, to be God's people. 
The events of this Passover celebration ended in tragedy on Friday with Jesus as being nailed to the tree with his death. But we know that there is a resurrection and there is a hope that's waiting to happen on Sunday. But these were challenging days for Jesus from Sunday through Friday. It would have tested anyone's faith. It was a long four to five days. And even Jesus' own disciples didn't fully understand what was transpiring. They were looking forward to this Passover meal with Jesus, who was to be their Savior. Jesus knew what was coming, yet he went with the plan. Death on the cross was a perfect was a, a per, was a perfected cruelty. Jesus knowingly sacrificed his dignity, faced humiliation, desertion, and permitted the process of the crucifixion to be carried out without resistance. He did this so you could believe in him, obtain freedom from our wrongs, and follow in obedience and expand the gospel. Look what the disciples did once they understood. They didn't keep it to themselves. They were able to share it and to grow it. There's much more of a relationship that Jesus calls us to than just sal salvation. There's much more than that to being committed to building his church today, to being an obedient disciple in the way that he has called you and to build his church. So a question or two. What are you doing for God and the church today? What will you do this week to expand the gospel or this year for him? How are you keeping up your spiritual life in these days when things are kind of slowed down? Do you push your foot on the accelerator to speed up your spiritual life so you can read and interact more? Or do you take that quiet time to reflect and to ask, God, what do you expect and want from me? Even when this is all done, the COVID-19 virus. How well are you standing up for God and his word? In today's scripture reading, the disciples were somewhat confused by Jesus' words that he would die. The Passover was a time of joy, a time of celebration, of recalling the events in the Old Testament when the Pharaoh released the children of Israel and he let them go. At the annual Passover week, People journeyed for miles and miles to be together to celebrate God, delivering their ancestors from the bondage of the Egyptian slavery. Over 1,800 years they've been celebrating this Passover meal. And now they were looking for the Messiah to come and to give them freedom from Rome. And when Jesus came down the street, it was just lined with people welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem as he rode the donkey. And they laid down the palm branches, they laid down their cloaks, and they sang, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So people were filled with joy and hope. The disciples were jubilant, but yet a little bit confused as Jesus was speaking about his blood, about his body, and his death. How could this be? Who would do this? From Sunday, Palm Sunday, through Thursday, Monday, Thursday. There was an abrupt change in the future of Jesus' life. By Thursday evening, Jesus was practically living in hiding. 
as religious leaders of the day plotted his death, using one of his own to betray him, that even reclined at the table where they were eating. See, Jesus knew what was ahead of him. They had come to Jerusalem to celebrate, to commemorate the past. But Jesus had come to die by execution, to be a different Savior than what the people expected or wanted. The people thought they would be delivered that Jesus would defeat the Roman Empire. As the week progressed, Jesus challenged the religious leaders in a greater capacity. He, he was infuriated with some of their behavior. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, religious piety, and how they were treating the poor. Passover week was a religious celebration, but it was made into a marketplace when Jesus entered it, where people were taking advantage of others. People had come to ask forgiveness of their sins and the lamb to be slaughtered so blood could be put on the altar and they could be forgiven of their sins. This temple of David and Solomon had become a den of robbers. Out of respect for God, Jesus overturned the money changer's table, if you remember that incident, and he drove out the merchants. He was so frustrated with what he was seeing. And this even made the religious leaders want to have Jesus put to death even more. They were getting infuriated with him. So Jesus continued to teach in the temple courts, pressing harder and harder for religious reforms and challenged the Sanhedrin who thought that they ran the temple and made the religious laws. But Matthew's gospel records Jesus saying this to the Pharisees. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed walls. And he was referring to the tombs that were oftentimes white where people's bodies were. You are like whitewashed walls, which on the outside look beautiful, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead of all kinds of filth, and all kinds of filth. See, we need to be clean on the inside, not just the outside. We need to have the right motive and morals where God sees us on the inside not just where people see us. It is easy to understand why the Pharisees and Sadducees desired to kill Jesus. You can see how he challenged their hierarchy, their religion, their authority, and their empire. See, Jesus was for the poor. He was for those who were held in bondage. He was for those who desired to know this new covenant that he was in insisting upon, to know love, and to have hope in God. On Thursday, Jesus told two of his disciples, Peter and John, to go into town. And they would be shown a room where they could prepare the Passover meal. And evening time came, the meal was prepared, and Jesus and his disciples would, were gathered there in the upper room one final time. Now understand the Israelites had been enslaved for around 400 years in Egypt before Moses let them out. So the Passover meal was filled with celebrations of God's providence and care and leading Israel all these years. So each part of the Passover meal held a significance that tells that story of deliverance. The bitter herbs that they ate, that they were served, reminded them of their ancestors' bitterness when they were slaves in Egypt. You know, when you're enslaved, you kind of get a little angry with people. You ever been in bondage or felt like you've been held captive in your own life? 
and you get a little angry, basically if it's another person or if it's an institution, you get a little angry. And so they were bitter towards the Egyptians who were holding them enslaved, in bondage, and making them do work for them and not giving them a lot to eat. And so the bitter herbs that were served reminded them of their ancestor bitterness while they were slaves. And they dipped those herbs in salt water to remind them of the tears of the hurt that their ancestors went through while they were in slavery. And they ate pareed apples. Now, I eat applesauce, but I've never eaten pareed apples that I know. I've given those to my children when they were little and fed them so I know what they look like. But they ate pareed apples, which reminded them of the mortar mix. Now, that's going to change the way I look at pareed apples. <laughs> but they did that to remind them of the mortar that they had to make for the bricks that they were being that were being laid. And of course, the unleavened bread was eaten to remind them of their haste in leaving captivity after the tenth plague. The slain lamb was a reminder of the blood put on their doorpost. If you remember that tenth plague, they put blood on the doorpost so the death angel would know to pass over them. And then Pharaoh let the people go. What do you do to remember Christ setting you free from bondage and delivering you from being hostage? What sacrifices do you make to serve him and his church? Jesus said in Mark chapter 14 verse 18, One of you will betray me. And he didn't say which one, but you can go over and read in the, in the 19th verse, he says, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. And that story of betrayal, you know, it kind of winds through all the Old and New Testament in Jesus' life, even at this point in Jesus' life. As that night progressed, Judas betrays Jesus. A little later, Peter would deny Jesus three times. And the disciples, many of them, deserted him in this hour of his need. Sometimes we feel deserted in our time of need. But Jesus did right here. So I struggle with these denials and betrayals personally. I find myself at times in, in discomfort as I read and reread this Bible passage in Mark. And I think of the times that I've not stood up for Christ. Or the times that I have denied him or betrayed him. Kind of left him up on the shelf. When I didn't be the light that I should have been. I cannot deny the pains of my own sin. When I hold a grudge, repeat a wrong, lose my temper, when I don't do what I should do. When I see other people being held in bondage, it hurts me. It is easy to put things before God if we're not careful, and that's called idol worship. You know, I can be selfish with my time. I can be selfish with my garden produce. Darling's much better at sharing it than I am. I can be, I can believe in the lies of the world when it says eat, drink, and be merry. When there are hungry people, some who have no place to lay their head, I can become a stray lamb ready to be slaughtered along with the world. How about you? Where are you in your relationship with God? Is it where it needs to be? Is it where you want it to be? And in this Passover meal, Jesus did something that had never been done before. 
he broke bread saying, Take it, eat it, this is my body. This was a startling and striking object lesson for the disciples. The bread represented Jesus' body. Within a few hours, which would be flogged. The flesh on his back would be ripped to shreds. And nails driven through his hands and feet. But it is by his stripes that we are healed. Then Jesus took the cup. And again he left them puzzled with his words. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Just as a cup. And they all drank from it. Startling news for the disciples. They had heard about covenants before and about blood and the sacrifice, but never by a human being, blood and sacrifice. So they were used to having an animal being sacrificed on its blood and it, pour, it being poured over the altar for the forgiveness of their sins. But Jesus is saying, I have died for you. This is my blood. This is my body. Take it and become new. Become powerful. My Father will forgive you if you believe in me and you're willing to sacrifice. Are you one of those disciples today? What sacrifices are you willing to make for God, for our stale friends, for his kingdom, for your community, for your family? How are you serving Jesus every day to leave your Christian mark for God? This meal has a defining moment for all of us, for every child of God. God's story through Christ is to be lived out in you. A story with a history, a story with a new vision, a new hope, as you serve him today, be thankful. Jesus walked into Jerusalem and completed the plan for your life, for your eternal life. Charlene's going to play There's Power in the Blood. She's going to play just one verse, and then I'll close with a prayer. serving you in the ways that